Hi there, Dr. Jess here. We're starting out the Did You Know series in January to learn more about head and neck pain. We're gonna start this with what do we do in an evaluation to figure out why someone might have head or neck pain? Well, in order to understand why we'd collect the data that we collect, it's helpful to understand what, what's important. Well, a lot, a lot of things are important. So if we look at the human body, we've got a skeleton and so the skeleton in incorporates lots of different bones. So we've got the cranium, we've got bones that make up the spine, so those are vertebrae, and then we've got these bones that are part of the uh, shoulder blades that go into the shoulder girdle and collarbone. So that bony anatomy is important because there could be something going on there that could be limiting range of motion. Maybe the facets, which are the joints in between the, the vertebrae, maybe they're getting a little bit stiff. Who knows? Lots of different things could be going on there. So when we look at bone mobility or joint mobility, that's gonna be something that we're gonna consider. Now, if we look at the nerves, there's tons of nerves that leave the neck. Well, there could be an issue with one of those. Maybe it's getting pinched. Uh, maybe there's a traction injury, all sorts of different things. So that's important to consider. Now let's look at the muscles because this is like, this one's pretty cool. So if we consider all of the muscles, we've got these layers and layers and layers of muscles that really help to hold up our body and to stabilize our spine and to be able to allow us to move our body like we want to be able to move. So with all of these different muscle layers, we can see that there's tons of muscles that actually connect from the mid back up to the neck, from the shoulders through the mid back up to the neck and muscles that are just in the neck itself. So when we are doing an evaluation, we need to consider how much can you move? Why would that movement be limited if it is? How is the posture looking? because that's gonna put a, a potentially a pretty big strain on the system, because if we've got tight pecs, it's gonna pull that shoulder forward and it's gonna put a lot of strain on the neck. Uh, and then we're gonna consider strength. How are you doing with being able to actually stabilize at the spine? We're gonna consider just mobility in general of joints. And then we're gonna just consider some of the special tests of different things that could be going on in the upper cervical spine, mid cervical spine, mid back, jaw. Um, a lot of different potential things could be going on based on the subjective or what you tell us. So today, what we're gonna talk about in the Did You Know series is headaches. I mean, these are so common. So learning a little bit more about why do headaches happen and what can we do in physical therapy that can be kind of helpful. So join. Now, if we're looking here at the skull, you can see that there's a lot of bones in here, but the other thing that's really important is what is going on with the muscles? So let's start to add those in and let's learn a little bit. So I'm gonna add layers. Now, here's what's really cool. As we start to get to these deep layers of muscles, you can't even really feel these very well um, because you've got other muscles that are covering them. Now, these are the ones that I'm most interested in. We're gonna do a little bit of a zoom in. So see these muscles that attach right to the spine and then they run up into the back of the head. So these muscles are called your suboccipital muscles. Now, the interesting thing is that these muscles can big time, other muscles as well, but these muscles are common contributors to cervicogenic headaches because when a trigger point or an area of the muscle that gets kind of bound down and a little bit disorganized instead of organized like it's supposed to be, it can refer pain into different areas of the body. And so these muscles in particular, they refer pain up into the head. And that can produce that headache that you're like, man, this thing, it just, when it comes back, it's such a pain in my butt. Um, and it really hurts. And it doesn't respond well to medication. I take, you know, Excedrin, Ibuprofen, Tylenol, and it doesn't really do a whole lot. Well, it could be one of these headaches. So this muscle in here commonly will refer up into kind of like the eye area. Um, some of them will refer um, more into like the top of the head, you know, things like that. But like, it'll be this um, oftentimes what we call unilateral or one-sided headache. You could have trigger points on both sides. Um, and there's other muscles as well. In the neck, 
that are common uh, that can also produce these what we call cervicogenic headaches. So understanding that like, oh, maybe that is the kind of headache I have because it doesn't respond well to medication might be worth trying to talk to a physical therapist about. Now, other types of headaches could be more tension type headaches. And that's more of when you're loading on a regular basis. So like maybe you just have constant tension, maybe you're clenching your teeth a lot, and there's this constant load in the muscle. That's typically more of a generalized headache. So as I add more muscles, we're gonna kind of see, check out all of these muscles in the back of the head. And look what, ha what happens, it comes up into the skull. So that wrap around headache that gets like really tight on your head, it feels like it's the whole head, maybe just the back of the head. Um, maybe it's in the temporalis, the muscles on the side of the head. So let's come in here, let's add some more. Ooh, look at that one. That's a big time from a clenching type uh, headache. Um, that, will, that will definitely give some pain. So understanding that headaches could be related to muscles, which could be related to all sorts of different things going on is like kind of helpful. So hopefully you learned a little bit uh, about headaches. And uh, if you wanna learn more, follow us on, um, we're gonna be releasing more information on a weekly basis. Uh, and don't hesitate to call the clinic if you really do need help. So what we're gonna talk about today is what we call radicular pain or pain that radiates from nerve. And there's a lot of different reasons for why this can happen. But first let's look at the anatomy and just get a little bit of a better appreciation for what the nerves do and why they're important. So if we see these different bones, right, there's openings in between here, that's called the foramen. And so as the nerves exit the spine, they exit through these openings. So when there's an issue with narrowing to that opening, which could be because of arthritis, it could be bone spurs, there could be a disc that's encroaching into that space, or just loss of disc height, a lot of different things can cause that space to be more narrow, which then leaves less space for the nerve to exit. And so when that happens, you can get pain that radiates into different parts of the arm or hand. And that all depends on which level of the spine is affected. So one part of the spine is gonna innervate maybe into the forearm, other parts are gonna innervate into the hand. So that just kind of dictates where the symptoms are that you would feel. The biggest thing to know is, one, not all radicular pain does require surgery, so that's important to know, and that there's times where conservative management can happen and times where surgery is indicated. And so imaging is a great way to be able to rule in or rule out whether surgery is fully indicated. Now, the other thing that's important to consider are the involvement of the muscles. So when the muscles in the front of the shoulder or the side of the neck are involved, it can also can create that compression on the nerve bundle. So sometimes it might not even be the spine itself, it might be outside of the spine. So if you can see the muscles here, so these muscles in the front of your chest, that's your pecs. And then we've got the muscles here on the side of the neck. So anywhere in there, you could be having some dysfunction, which creates that tension on the nerve. So just that's what like going through an evaluation would figure out, doing some imaging would also help figure that out. But just know that like there are options out there that might not be something that you've considered, which could be contributing to pain. So we're going to talk about whiplash because this is something that can happen, yes, in a car accident, especially if you're rear-ended, but the other thing can happen, a slip and fall, any sort of traumatic injury where that head flings forward and then flings back quickly can create a whiplash-related injury. Now, what's important to understand with whiplash is that it can actually create significant headache and a lot of pain that doesn't always resolve just with rest and ice or heat. So really having an understanding of all of the different muscles in the back of the neck can help understand, oh goodness, like no wonder I'm in so much pain and why I'm potentially getting those recurring headaches. So similar to our, our headache video where we talked about the suboccipital muscles and then the other muscles, in this video we're going to be talking a little bit more just about the length of some of these muscles on the back of the neck because when they get mad they can really create some symptoms. So looking here you can see 
the muscles that run up into the base of the head actually originate all the way down lower into the spine. So when you have that whiplash injury and your head goes forward, it's not just your head. I mean, it tractions all the way down the mid back. These muscles are connected pretty far down. So I'm gonna start adding some layers here. You can see, I mean, look at this. We've got so many muscles when you put on that big, um, that big quick motion, that big retraction back, all of these muscles, all the way through the mid back, all the way up into the base of the head can get very angry with you. I'm gonna add one more layer here. Actually, there we go, and that's the last layer. So see how it's all connected? That mid back and the neck, big time, huge connection between the two going out to the shoulders. So don't sell yourself short. If you are still having symptoms from whiplash, please make sure that somebody is helping to address what's going on with those muscle layers and how can I restabilize to make sure that I've got proper posture to give the muscle something positive to do and then also calm down any trigger points or dysfunctional areas that are still um, giving you symptoms. All right, everybody, stay tuned for next month.